concerns the attitude of the American army to the question of infiltration of Polish Jews before your visit to Poland. What was their attitude and did they intend to stop the infiltration? Well, let me go back in my memory to the circumstances of the time. Uh, I'll be as uh, accurate and helpful as I can be, but I'm not 100% sure of, of every detail. Uh, when Judge uh, Rifkin left the post of advisor, uh, I think it was in March 1946, uh, it was felt then that another advisor would not be needed, that things were fairly quiet and fairly stable. But then a variety of uh, developments occurred, uh, which culminated, as I recall, in the Landsberg case, Landsberg trial, uh, which led to a reconsideration of this decision. Uh, I think also uh, there was pressure from the uh, Jewish groups, from the displaced persons, from uh, people in Europe working with them, uh, that uh, they needed somebody at court. They needed somebody who could be helpful to them on a higher level. And therefore, again, the uh, Jewish organizations were asked to consider sending somebody over and uh, they agreed on me. And I went over in May, I think, 1946 to, um, to begin work there. And when I went, I assumed that I would stay for about four months. I arranged to come back to my congregation for the holidays. But found uh, that particularly in the summer of 46, influx from Poland and a tremendous pressing unsolved problems that it was necessary for me, morally necessary, for me to stay on. So I arranged with my congregation to continue. In fact, uh, not necessarily for publication, but just for the record, I uh, offered to um, uh, renounce my salary from the congregation during that entire period, whatever income I had from them, uh, because I felt that I uh, simply had to stay on in Europe, and I'd been away from the congregation for four years uh, directing the Jewish chaplaincy program with the States Armed Forces, and this meant adding another year to a congregation that had been neglected too long. Now, par paragraph, I might say, when I, when I uh, got there, uh, it took me uh, a little while to uh, get some orientation. Um, and then uh, I began to sense what the, uh, what the attitudes were. I found that on the whole, General McNarney, who was the commanding general, was a uh, fine human being. Uh, and nothing that happened subsequently led me to change uh, this view. He really was a uh, kind-hearted, warm-hearted man. One could always appeal to him on uh, humane grounds and get him to uh, take some action along that line. On the other hand, I found that on lower levels, there was a great deal of resentment and irritation with regard to the displaced persons, uh, that they were felt to be troublemakers, uh, that they were regarded as uh, uh, radicals, uh, that they were irritating the Germans, uh, that they were making the task of the United States Armed Forces much more difficult. And the word Zionist was anathema. Uh, to them. They didn't quite understand what it meant. Uh, they associated it with uh, communism, all kinds of things which were very uh, remote from the, uh, the from the realities. In fact, one of the most interesting experiences I had there, and perhaps of my life, was uh, when uh, General Huebner, Clarence Huebner, who became chief of staff to General McNarney and subsequently to uh, General uh, Clay, who succeeded McNamee, when General Huebner invited to his home the top officers of the European Command to spend an evening with me. And I gave these people a lecture on Jewish history and Jewish problems. And I interpreted for them the thinking, the needs, the emotions of the displaced persons. Uh, and that was the most interesting uh, class I've ever had in my life of that type. Uh, and it was for them an eye-opener because they didn't have 
the most elementary knowledge of Jewish life and problems of what the people were like. And as I did it for them on that level, also I understood, particularly since the army had changed, the men who had fought against the Germans had gone home. A new group of youngsters had come in, and they were attracted by the orderliness of the, the Germans, the external virtues. They were attracted by German girls, by the hospitality of German homes, so that they were not friendly to the displaced persons. And therefore, I initiated a whole orientation program utilizing the facilities of the army, uh, utilizing the, uh, the army newspaper and other publications to uh, help them understand these people who were, who were living in their midst and whose unresolved problems they would still have to, to deal with. Now, uh, the uh, attitude then uh, tended to be distrustful toward the displaced persons. Uh, Germany was... Uh, severely bombed uh, much of the cities the housing the cities had been destroyed uh, there was no eagerness at all no desire at all to have more displaced persons come in to take up the housing in fact if anything they wanted that the uh, germans should have more housing rather than less because they had the, the problems there were large numbers of german displaced persons coming in from the from the east uh, so that I would say, on the whole, uh, on the functioning levels, and this certainly included General Stanley Mickelson, who at that time was in charge of the program for the Army, who at that time, in my judgment, left a great deal to be desired in his attitudes and action, but who in the course of my year and a half uh, developed much more understanding, became much more helpful, uh, and proved to be a, a decent person in these matters uh, toward the end and a helpful person. But on the functioning level, uh, the army uh, tended to be distrustful, uh, worried about the displaced persons, um, and, and needed a great deal of guidance and help uh, to, uh, to live with the problem. And I think, if I may say so, that that was one of the contributions that I made working from within, having the confidence of the top-level military, and having the access to the media. Uh, we, we did bring about a change uh, in their attitudes based upon understanding. Uh, now, um, there were a number of crises in the period between my arrival in May 46 and the Celts of Pogrom which took place, as I recall, on the 4th of July, 46, in, in Kelsa. Uh, there was the Landsberg trial. There was also something, as I recall, in Stuttgart, in which German police had entered a camp and led to some shooting. Uh, and uh, the, uh, a variety of other incidents, uh, which made uh, the problem more complicated uh, but then, um, within two or three days after the Celts of Pogrom, I received a telephone call from Berlin from Henry Montour. He had just come out of uh, Poland. He'd been there, apparently, when the Pogrom had taken place. And he pleaded with me, he urged me, he commanded me to get into uh, Warsaw immediately, to get to Poland immediately, and. Uh, and try to be helpful, get the army to be helpful. So, re recognizing the seriousness of the matter, I took it up with General McNarney at once, because I knew it would have implications for us in Germany. And he arranged for me to be flown uh, to, uh, to Warsaw. And uh, I asked Rabbi Herbert Friedman, who at that time was Jewish chaplain in Berlin. He had not yet joined my staff as my uh, military aide. I asked him to come with me, and uh, we uh, uh, went to uh, Warsaw, uh, then we went down to Lodz, uh, we uh, talked with the survivors of the pogrom in uh, uh, the hospital in Lodz, who still couldn't understand what had happened to them, because, as I recall, they were passing through Kelce rather than natives of Kelce. There were no grievances that the local people could have against them as individuals. 
but uh, the uh, uh, indigenous anti-Semitism of Poland, the uh, resentment against the new regime and the Jews who were in it, the incitement by the Catholic Church, all these and other factors led to um, the, the pogrom. Now, what we found at that time was that uh, people wanted to get out. Uh, the Jews in Poland, and most of them, as I recall, were Jews who had come back from Russia, uh, who had found haven in Russia when they fled before the advancing Nazi armies in the late fall of 39, and were now given the option of remaining in Russia or returning to Poland, came back, found Poland in ruins, found their families gone, found their homes gone, uh, found themselves in an atmosphere of anti-Semitism, of violent anti-Semitism. They wanted to move. And uh, uh, nothing, n not that we tried to dissuade them, but we tried to sound them out, nothing that could be said about the uh, camps in Germany, nothing could be said about the uncertainties of the future, for the future was very uncertain and black in the summer of 46. And no one knew how long they'd be caught in Germany. Nothing we could say could deflect them from their intention to get out. And therefore, uh, when I returned to um, uh, Frankfurt, took the matter up at once with General McNarney, um, and I urged him uh, to uh, anticipate and be ready for and be willing to receive what I estimated would be about 100,000. Yes from Poland, and the number was almost uh, precisely 100,000 yeah. of those uh, who came. And then I worked with the Jewish organizations in this country so as to get acceptance here from the State Department and the White House of keeping the borders open, uh, which uh, then uh, were, were um, there had been talk about having them closed. There had been talk. There had been talk closing them. In fact, uh, uh, I'm not sure that I want this incident uh, printed, and let me say for the moment that without my permission, I don't want it printed. Well, perhaps I'll... Yeah. Mr. Levitt told me of an incident. Um, he couldn't remember the date. Uh, they had been invited to Mr. Acheson at the State Department. He thinks it may have been before the big influx actually started, perhaps at the beginning of July, just after the pogrom, or just after you had got back. Um, uh, where uh, there were military aides and they presented uh, the facts uh, to the heads of the Jewish organization saying that uh, look uh, this is costing us a fantastic amount of money and this cannot go on and we can't bear the costs and there are all kinds of troubles and so on. Uh, what have you got to say about this? Uh, well, uh, he, Mr. Levitt couldn't tell whether it was they who convinced them or not but anyway the borders remained open. But there was that moment when they had been invited to the Secretary of State to discuss this problem. Would that be about that time, you think? Uh, I think it might be, might have been. Incidentally, while I think of it, uh, you ought to talk to Cy Kennan in Washington. Have you talked with him? No. I. L. Kennan. Yeah, oh yes, I've got the name. Who yes. was executive mm. of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, of which I'm chairman. Mm. He was the executive at that time of the American Jewish Conference. Yeah. Before I agreed to accept this invitation to go to Europe, I said I would not deal with separate Jewish groups. I wanted one address, and I wanted unified action in this country uh, if I were going to take this responsibility in Germany. And the miracle was performed. Mm. There was unity, and there was a single address, and the American Jewish Conference, of which Kennan was then the executive, was the channel. So I would recommend that before you leave this country, uh, you talk to Kennan, uh, who will have a vast store of information on this, which the others may not have, uh, because he dealt with it daily on a, on a functioning basis. Yeah. Now continue with your uh, Yes. Uh, now, uh, there are perhaps these, the next, my next two questions are connected, so I'll ask them together. Uh, there was an incident at the beginning of August when General McNani issued a statement that no further Jewish refugees or infiltrates would be accepted into the United States zone. 
And a few days afterwards, there was what amounted to a retraction from that. He said that he had only meant that mass organized groups from the British and French zone would not be accepted, but that on principle, in principle, the, the borders would remain open to bona fide infiltrates. Now, I wondered what made him retract, whether there was concentrated pressure, if you remember the incident. And, uh, uh, well, I think I, that, that's the... Well, my impression is that he was never opposed to keeping the borders open. I can't recall his ever having opposed it. So it may be correct that he was referring at that particular time to movement out of the other zones. Or, let me add this, I tried to get him to simplify the movement. It would have been much simpler if the uh, people were permitted to come directly into Germany from Czechoslovakia rather than go down through Vienna, a circuitous, difficult route, yeah. and then fan out into the camps of Austria and Germany. In other words, I wanted a, a ready kind of a, of a movement since they were coming anyway, and he said no. He said that would be an invitation mm -hmm. to them to come, and that he, he couldn't do, but that the borders would be kept up. And in other words, while I couldn't exactly evaluate uh, where, where the greatest influence uh, was exerted, and I'm sure that uh, the president, who was always sympathetic, I, I, I met with him. I, and if you want, I must have somewhere the, uh, the account of my meeting with President Truman that on this matter. Really and, uh, uh, and General Hildring was helpful. And Herbert Fierce, by the way, do you know him at all? Does oh, yes, yes. He's worth talking to in yes. Washington because he was General Hildring's uh, top assistant in these matters. I'm sure they were influential in keeping the borders open, but also I, I'm convinced that General McNarney's readiness to do it played a, a major role in the in it. And in that connection, of course, I played a role in, in uh, keeping him informed and in keeping him sympathetic and, uh, and in getting his help with the practical problems that, uh, that developed. Uh, now, I, I, this now I'm not quite sure about. The um, there was a time I think during August when there was a when there was some pressure from the Jewish agency representatives from Chaim Hoffman and others that uh, uh, the uh, movement would be much bigger than anticipated and that in fact a hundred thousand would not be enough. Uh, do you remember that? Uh, um, and uh, if I if I'm not mistaken, there was some talk of uh, uh, you uh, approaching the American authorities of increasing the expectation from a hundred thousand upward, a revision of the figure. At the moment, I can't. Uh, I can't recall that. Uh, I'd have to check the records mm -hmm. if, if I could. But I, you're talking about August 1946. Yes. Yes. I can't quite see why there should have been such pressure because there was no attempt to uh, close the borders at that time. No, it wasn't that, but they felt that the figure of 100,000 uh, might be superseded by a much larger figure and they wanted to be sure that the further Im infiltration would not be opposed. Mm -hmm. That was the feeling. Well, I, I don't recall it, but actually, uh, as, as I recall, uh, 100,000 was my estimate of the numbers that were coming in, but it did not represent 100,000 uh, visas to enter. It could mm -hmm. have been 110,000, 110,000 yeah. would have come in, or 90,000, mm -hmm. so that I don't quite see why there should have been any particular pressure to say not 100,000, but 150,000, because no, as I recall, no specific number uh, was uh, given permission to come in. As they poured in, they were accepted. Mm -hmm. Many of them, of course, got into the camps in Austria, for which I also had responsibility, where they weren't treated as well as they were in Germany. Yes. Uh, there, is, uh, there is the the question of the Italian program. You remember that you suggested to the JDC in New York and uh, to their representatives in Italy, and you visited Italy at that time, um, to accept uh, to relieve the pressure on Germany and the, that the Italians should accept another 10,000 Jews from Germany. And uh, you uh, 
send wires to the JDC here that they should support these people once they got there. Now, I yes, yes, this Italian uh, uh, proposal, and then there's a point where all the correspondence breaks off, and I wondered what happened to the proposal. Why wasn't it accepted? Well, let me uh, try to recall the uh, Italian incident, and let me say also there that I wrote up. Um, my uh, conference with uh, the Pope, Pope Pius XII, and uh, if possible, before you leave, I will give you both the report of my talk with President Truman uh, and my talk with uh, uh, Pope, the Pope, which will throw some light on these things. Uh, I told General McNarney that uh, we ought to do everything we could, which of course the Army also wanted to get this place persons out of Germany. And one way would be to get more into Italy. And that uh, involved, I knew, um, consent of the Italian government, the aid of UNRWA, of which LaGuardia was then the head, and the head of, and the aid of the Joint Distribution Committee. Uh, and I also knew that uh, if we could get the support of the Pope, it would be of great, uh, great help. So it was in this statement, uh, which I'll give you, I hope. Um, I met with the Pope three quarters of an hour and uh, had a very frank, uh, business-like talk with him on it and uh, got his uh, agreement to talk to the uh, uh, Italian premier and also uh, his indicated readiness to talk to the church in, in Poland about uh, the violent anti-Semitism there, what influence the church could have in stopping it. Uh, now, I never, of course, knew precisely what the Pope did. He didn't report to me, but he seemed to be genuinely concerned and seriously committed to doing something about it. Uh, I did, as I recall, have a serious problem with JDC, because they felt they didn't have the money. And I became very uh, indignant I think I even threatened them at the time, yes, uh, did. <laughs> because uh, it seemed to me that this was so so urgent uh, that they should uh, find a way to uh, agree to support these people in Italy, because I knew, of course, that sending them to Italy meant we were sending them to a staging area for movement to Palestine. Uh, now, uh, a great many people did get there, one way or the other. Great many people got there um, illegally. Oh yes, I know that. But wh why? What happened to the actual proposal? Did the Italians refuse, or did the JDC refuse in the end? I am afraid that I can't tell you exactly uh, uh, what happened. Uh, this was in uh, late August, early September. No, oh, no, this was much later. This was already in the winter of 46. Well, my visit to Italy was in late August, early September, 46. It was just prior to my returning to Rochester for the holidays and then went back to, uh, to Germany. So uh, that was the time when I was directly involved. May I, may I uh, remind you of the, the, the sequence there because I've just read the document. So. Um, it, it started uh, in August. The pro first proposal on the Italian scheme was in August. And then you became very indignant at the JDC, not only because they refused to participate, or they, they made it, but because they were dragging the thing out so, so long. And it, this, this carried on throughout October. You got back in October, after the holidays, and in November. At the beginning of December, the negotiations break off. and. Uh, that that was already winter, and you you were saying, well, look, you you must get these people before the actual snow comes in because you have to to prepare camps for them and so on and blankets. And, uh, and then there's silence. I'm afraid I can't recall uh, the uh, uh, precise development of the time. I I knew there was uh, unauthorized movement. Oh, yes, yes. In fact, uh, 
weekend here. I'm, Uh, let me tell you uh, something which perhaps should not go into the next question is uh, about the aftermath of the Morgan incident. Lieutenant General Sir Frederick Morgan, you remember he made a statement, there was a big uh, fuss about it. Uh, the